Now this is up there, we know. Really? I mean, what can you be re- re- absolutely certain of in life? Well, there's a few, uh, I looked up a few uh, st- um, statements that uh, are very common. The only thing we can be certain of in life is death and taxes. You've probably heard that one. The only thing we can count on is change. The only thing we can be certain of is uncertainty. Well, how about this one? What are 10 things you can always count on? Any ideas? It's actually a riddle. It's a dumb one, though. Our fingers. Okay, it's a groaner. Sorry. That was for them, the, you know, the, the younger ones, not the rest of you. 10 things you can always count on your fingers. Or your toes, if you want, I guess. Well, in life, as a follower of Jesus Christ, there are things that we can definitely count on for certain. And they can make a pretty big difference in our lives. Now, what we're doing today is we're actually wrapping up the book of 1 John. We've been actually reading it, studying it, uh, been preaching on it since October 1st. And we're going, this is the very last one. This is wrapping up the book. And there are things here that he brings out right at the end. He says, you can know this, you can know this, you can know this. Things to to know for certain in response um, to basically he's talking about how to deal with false teachers. The whole book is kind of focused around that. It's false teachers are coming to these people and he's telling these people how to deal with the things that they're bringing them and with the false teachers themselves. And he's saying there's some things you can know for certain about that. So he's really reviewing in fact, the whole book in some ways and uh, what he's been saying throughout the whole book. And he, d- he does that. He reviews this and he goes over these things by helping us understand how a real follower of Jesus, Jesus lives and what they believe. And he brings back some of the things, like I said, he's talked about, such as followers of Jesus are obedient to God's commandments, especially to his commandment to love one another. And he said that many times throughout the book. Also, that true followers of Jesus also stick to the basics of who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, and also to what he has done. The fact that he is the Son of God, whose death on the cross and his resurrection was needed to bring salvation, to bring forgiveness, in other words, to those who repent of sin and put their trust in Jesus. So he's already talked about a bunch of those things. And he's now uh, talking about how the believers are also united with God. He's talked about that fairly recently. How the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, um, or abide, live within believers. And that we abide and live within, and He in us, sorry, as well. And because we have the Son, because we have Jesus, we have eternal life. And John wants us, the writer of this book, wants us to deep down, undisputedly, without a doubt, know all of those things. He wants us to know that we have eternal life. So, verse 13 of chapter 5. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. And that's his purpose for the book. He's stating, right toward the end of the book, he tells us plainly why he wrote it. So that we would know that we have eternal life. What he wants to do is get rid of the doubt that naturally comes with false teaching. False teaching brings doubt and uncertainty. He wants to bring certainty about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So John makes a distinction between the false teachers and the believers by saying that the believers are the ones uh, who believe in the name of the Son of God. And those who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. To believe in the name in the name of Jesus means that you basically hold to all of who Jesus is and what he has done. His name means all of who he is. So for those who believe in that way, believe in the name of Jesus, he says you may know that you have eternal life. But for the false teachers who deny Jesus... And that's, he stated that throughout the book. They actually deny who Jesus is. They don't have eternal life because they've denied the only source of eternal life, which is Jesus Christ himself. So why is it important that, we would want, that he would want us to know that we have eternal life? Basically because it gives you total confidence in God and in your relationship with him. Otherwise, why would you even bother trying to keep God's commandments? Why would you bother trying to love others, as he said, as you love yourself and try and do that? 
if I'm not truly forgiven and, don't, and belong to God, I kind of really don't have hope in anything. For that matter, why even pray? If God's just the force out there and I cannot truly know, know him and he doesn't really care about me, what good would praying even be? Well, the thing is we do know we belong to God. We can know that we belong in Jesus and he is in us and that he has given us eternal life. So when we pray, we can know that God hears and responds when we pray. The next two verses, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we asked of him. So the first word in uh, verse 14 says, is and. That joins us to 13, verse 13. Verse 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and this is the confidence we have toward him. So they're connected. If we know we have eternal life, that gives us confidence when we pray. Jesus actually, give us confidence that Jesus actually hears us and responds to us. Now, there is a condition here. It's a, it's a conditional sentence, uh, grammatically what you would call it. Um, basically, if we do such and such, then Jesus will hear us. And it, what it is, is if we ask anything according to his will, you could insert the then, then he hears us. That makes it pretty clear that we aren't asking for ourselves. We aren't asking what we want, what we desire apart from God. But rather, God is changing us. He's working in us so that we want and desire what Jesus would want and desire in any situation. Hopefully, you see the difference there. When you pray and just ask for yourself, that is not praying according to his will. Praying according to his will is praying according to what Jesus would want, what he would desire in whatever that situation is that you're praying about. And that's exactly the same thing as praying in Jesus' name. When somebody prays and says, I pray this in the name of Jesus, that isn't just tacking the name of Jesus on the end of a prayer like a magic word. Like if you don't do that, nothing's going to happen. That's not why you do that. You're praying according to all of who Jesus is and what he would want. And that would fit, what, basically what would fit his purpose and bring him glory and bring him honor. The more we live a life of obedience to Jesus, the more we desire what he desires. And our heart leans more toward obedience and confidence in Jesus rather than disobedience and condemnation. Back in chapter 3 of 1 John, um, he talked exactly about that. He said in chapter 321, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. He's correlating confidence in answered prayer to the fact that we actually live an obedient life toward God. So having confidence that Jesus hears us because we ask according to his will happens as a result as of a life that lives in, lived in obedience to God. The point is, what he's saying here is we can be confident in our praying. We can be bold in what we ask. We can ask it confidently. Jesus wants to hear and he wants to work in response to what we pray. Now, how often, and I think of this for myself, how often when you pray about things, do you think of, the, of God's will, of the will of Jesus? What would Jesus want when we pray? How often do we actually think about that? That what we're praying about will actually bring him glory, and it is for him. And that's what he's trying to tell us to do. Jesus wants us to be confident in our praying. But now as we move on, John also now applies what he was just saying about having confidence in God hearing our prayers to praying for our fellow believers who fall into sin. So he wants us to be confident in our prayers. And now he says, be confident when you pray for one another as believers. Verse 16 and 17. It says, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin and not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Now, before I get into what's that mean, lead to death, not lead to death, 
the point to, to think right in the beginning there, right at the top, is, the, is that he's saying that we're talking about a brother, somebody who's a, a fellow believer that has done something wrong, that has sinned in some way. Now, the topic of believers sinning, that's actually been throughout this whole book. Started right in chapter 1, where he wrote about how false, the false teachers, one of the first things he said about them is that they denied that they had any sin at all. And that they lived in darkness. And they wouldn't admit their sin. But true followers of Jesus admit their sin and turn from it. John 1, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says that's what's characteristic of somebody who's a follower of Jesus. We don't say, well, I don't sin, I'm perfect, I'm good. No, we admit it and we confess it and God forgives us. In the second chapter, John says that if believers sin and confess it, like he said in verse 9, Jesus would defend us because he already took God's wrath for us on the cross in our place. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That means somebody who goes to your defense. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, there's a word we use a lot every day, propitiation. No, we don't, of course. It's a technical word. It's a biblical word. It's a technical word that for Jesus, satisfying God's wrath for our sin and removing its penalty from us. So propitiation means that Jesus satisfied God's wrath for our sin and he removes that penalty for, from us completely. And that's what that word means. And that's, of course, what he did on the cross when he died on the cross for us and then rose from the dead. So what he's trying to say here is it's clear that believers can and do sin. He says, I write these things so you don't sin. But if you do, we have an advocate. We have someone who defends us, Jesus, who, by the way, took God's wrath for your sin. So it's clear that believers can and do sin, but it's also characteristic that we don't, that we don't want to do that. We hate our sin and will turn from it in confession and repentance, asking God for forgiveness. So let's get back to the verses on hand here. Verses uh, back in chapter 5. What is John talking about? About sins not leading to death or sins that lead to death. What is that all about? Because my understanding was that all sin leads to death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. If we sin, we deserve death. And that is what that's saying. It's, it's talking about the fact that sin itself causes death. We see that in Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 2 and 3, um, as well as death is the penalty from God that we all deserve for the sins, for the wrongdoings that we have done against God. So what is he talking about here? He's not actually talking about that. Remember, he's talking about um, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin. His brother is the key thing here. And as I already said, and as John has already said, believers sin. We don't live perfect lives after committing our lives to Christ. We fail. We sin. We do wrong things still. So what do we do when we do that? What he's saying here is that uh, this type of sin, sin not leading to death, is the sin of the believer, essentially. In other words, it won't lead to death because Jesus did ultimately pay the price for it. But John is saying that we do need to be praying for each other. We are to pray for another believer who sins, that they will have repentance and not stubbornness. We pray for their restoration to obedient life and strength for them to continue living for God in obedience. We pray that they will not continue in sin. They will not continue in disobedience to God. So do you pray like that for each other, for one another? If you see someone doing something wrong, do you think, oh, that stupid person or whatever or do we pray for them do we pray for their restoration do we pray that they will continue in obedience do we try to help each other that's what john wants us to be doing and he's saying that we can be confident that such prayer in that kind of prayer that god will answer it that he will answer he will bring restoration to that person he will help now when it says sin that leads to death he says there is sin that leads to death that's the sin of the unbeliever 
And we, to understand that, we have to realize the context of the whole book is false teachers. He's dealing with how do we deal with people who are bringing false information about Christ to us. The false teachers, he's already talked about, that they denied that Jesus is the Christ, the one who God sent to be the Messiah, to be the Savior. That they said he wasn't that. They said that he was not the Son of God and that his death was not necessary for salvation. So if that's what you believe, if that's what the false teachers believed, then that's going to lead to death. Because there is no salvation other than in Jesus. Now, you might be thinking of a few other reasons uh, what that term means. You might think, well, maybe that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's something you hear about in the Gospels. Um, that's actually something totally different. That is ascribe, what that is, is describe, ascribing the miracles Jesus did to Satan. So some people were doing that. They were saying, well, Jesus is doing miracles, but it's all through Satan. And it's like, no. Uh, they called that blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And that's a whole other story, but that's not what's happening here. What John is talking about here is unbelief that keeps the false teachers, or anybody else for that matter, from truly believing, from putting their trust in Jesus' death and resurrection for them so that they can be forgiven of their sins. So John is saying, I do not say that one should pray for that, which means we don't pray in the same way for that person as we would for a believer that we see sinning. A believer, what they need is repentance, turning back to God, and restoration to the loving relationship with God that they already have. What a false teacher needs, or for that matter, anybody else, anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus, what they need to be prayed for is that their heart would change and that they would see what God has done for them and, in, and respond in repentance and faith, for, in putting their faith in Jesus, and so that they actually come into a real relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we pray for them. But when we pray for each other, for other believers, for those who have already chosen to, fo to follow Christ, our confidence in prayer helps us to pray for each other when we sin, when we fail in different ways. And we know that it's God's will for people to turn to him in repentance and that he will forgive and he will restore those who will ask God to forgive them. In fact, we can be confident, we can know that since we belong to God, that he's actually at work in us to keep us from sinning. We know that God keeps his people from sinning. Let's go to the next verses, 18 and 19. It says, And we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now that might actually sound kind of contradictory to what we were just reading. Uh, where it says that we should pray for a brother, for another believer who commits sin. And now he seems to be saying that once someone has, has been born of God, in other words, becomes a believer, a follower of Jesus, that we don't sin. That sort of seems inconsistent. Well, actuality, it's really not. Um, that word where he says, keep on sinning, uh, back there in verse 18, it's actually a present verb in the, the original language, which means it's describing an ongoing state of the person. And it's exactly the same as what was talked about earlier in this book in chapter 3, where basically um, John was talking about people making a practice of sinning, which means a habitual way of life. This is your habitual way of life. It's what you like to do. It's what you want to do. It's what you do. Those who belong to God, who are born of God, can't do that anymore. God changes us so that, yes, we fall, we sin, but we also hate it. We don't want to do it. We would rather have a lifestyle of righteousness, of doing what's right, of being obedient to God. And here's the verses there where it states that in 1 John 3, 9 and 10. It says, no one born of God makes a practice, a lifestyle. Whoops, sorry, there we go. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. That is not their lifestyle. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So John is realistic. He's telling us in chapter 5 here, we need to pray for each other. We need to pray for fellow believers who sin 
because he knows we often fail and we need support for each other. But more than that, John wants us to know that we can live beyond our weaknesses. We can live in God's strength because he gives us his strength and protection. Let's go back to verse 18 there. He says, we know that everyone who's been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So when it says there, uh, we know everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him. That second one there, he who is born of God, is, refers to Jesus. He who is the first begotten of the Father, as he's called in other places in Scripture. But that he protects, Jesus protects us. He protects his own people. The world, as it says there, is in the power of the evil one. But Jesus won't let the evil one, won't let Satan touch us. So do you really know that? Do you really know that we do not have to be affected in that way? If we have listened to what John's been saying in this book, we can know that. John wants us to grasp that reality and live our lives in view of that truth. Jesus has broken the power of sin in the lives of his, own, of his people. And we can choose to obey God or not to. We can also choose to not sin. And even, have, and even the power of the evil one, Satan, cannot touch us. Now that's pretty encouraging. That gives us hope that as we live in this world, though we may fail, and though things around us look bad, Jesus protects us, and the evil one, Satan, literally cannot touch us at all. Now John is also referring to the false teachers. That's kind of the context of the whole book again, bringing that back. Because they are described as those who are in the world. Because they have chosen to reject Jesus' sacrifice for their sins. They are part of the world which lies in the power of the evil one. And Jesus protects his people from their influence, from the false teaching as well. Now, how does he do that? How does he protect us? Well, a major way that Jesus was protecting his people from the false teachers is through what John was writing in this book. He's bringing the truth. He's showing them the difference. Now, in verse 20... John brings his strongest statement about who Jesus is and what that practically means for us. We know who Jesus is. Let's look at verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Now, the false teachers had denied Jesus was the Son of God. We know that he really is the Son of God. And that understanding graciously comes from God himself. It says that uh, the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. God gives us that understanding. That's not something that I'm smart enough to know. God does that in us. And that through Jesus, we are brought into a right relationship with God. We can know him. For sure, we can know him for real. In fact, John describes believers in Jesus as those who are in God. Because we are also in his son, Jesus Christ. As it says there, and we are in him who is true, in the Father, and in his son, Jesus Christ. Somehow we're united with Jesus in such a way that it, we are so closely described as that we are with him. We are in him. And that's how united we are with him. And And the thing is, why is that important to know? How does it help us to know that we are in Jesus and he is in us if we are his followers? Well, from our section today, here's a few of the things. Being in Jesus gives us assurance of eternal life. We know that we have eternal life through him. We don't have to wonder. We do not have to doubt. It also gives us confidence that he will hear our prayers, even as we pray for fellow believers who have sinned. We can be sure that they and us can be forgiven and restored. Being in Jesus also gives us confidence that we are protected from the evil one. And besides all that, let me state the obvious, being in Jesus gives us a real, close, living relationship with the holy, righteous, good, loving God. Now that's a pretty unfathomable privilege to be in Jesus in that way. 
Hebrews 4.16 says it like this. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may have mercy, receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If we are in Jesus, we can have confidence to come to God completely with confidence that we will be accepted, that we will find our help that we need. And we can do that, do that because we know who Jesus is. Now, the last statement of verse 20 is pretty incredible. It says, he is the true God and eternal life. That is speaking of Jesus. He is the true God and eternal life. That's as plain a statement as you could make that Jesus is God. Now, of course, that is stated throughout the, the New Testament in lots of different ways and places. But that, again, is something the false teachers would have denied. And it's something all false teachers today deny as well. Jesus being true God means, of course, that he is the source of eternal life for us. He is the true God and eternal life. And John has already told us that as well in other places in the book. He is the source of eternal life for everyone who believes in him. It also means that everything Jesus ever said and promised is absolutely true and can be depended on. So we have Jesus as our Lord, as our Savior, as our brother, as our friend, and he is with us in the face of all that we face in life. Now this Jesus, who we know, who we are in, and who is in us, is God Almighty, the all-powerful God. Now that blows my mind. Now as we come to the last verse, which at first glance doesn't seem to connect with all this stuff John has been saying, but in fact, it's John's last statement wrapping up that book. And it's a pointed statement that brings us back to focus on the book's purpose. And it is, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, he addresses these people as little children, even though they're adults and everything. That's just his term of endearment to them. They're very dear to him. He says, keep yourselves from idols. Now, if you remember, the purpose of the book is to help believers deal with false teachers and their false teaching. The word idol here is a word that can literally mean a made-up statue of a god of some kind, a physical statue, an idol. Um, but it also means a false understanding of who God is, a false representation, a false idea of God that is different than who God revealed himself to be. That goes along with an idol. An idol is a, a statue that you worship that isn't God, that supposedly represents God, but it's false. And the idea of what God you are worshiping goes along with that. And that's what he's referring to here. So he's basically, when he says, keep yourselves from idols, it means he wants his readers to keep themselves away from the false ideas of the false teachers that is coming to them, that they're trying to convince them of. So his final parting thought, after all he's written to help these people, is simply stay away from that teaching. Don't listen to the false ideas. You know better now. Don't listen to them because we know. We know, first of all, that we have eternal life. Don't listen to those ideas. Keep yourselves from us because we know we have eternal life. If you know you have eternal life, don't live for yourself now. Live in the light of eternity. We know God hears us and responds when we pray. So if we know that, pray boldly. Pray boldly according to his will, according to what Jesus would want done in this situation when you pray. We know that God keeps his people from sinning and protects us from the evil one. If we know that, don't mess with sin. You're free to not sin and live in obedience to God. Live in that freedom. We know we are from God. We know we are born of God and belong to him. So if we know that, don't live like we belong to the world. God is our father and we are his children. Depend on him. Love him. We know the son of God has come. Jesus is the physical expression of God's love for us. So if that's the case, let's show God's love to others around us, especially to other believers as well, but to everybody. And above all else, love God himself. We know that God, that he has caused us to know himself. It's only in God's grace 
his free gift to us that we know him. So if that's the case, we need to tell others around us who don't know about God about his grace and love as well. We know we are in the Father and in Jesus Christ. Being united with the Father in Jesus means that all these things that I've just been listing are true. God wants us humans to know him closely, to love him, and to be with him forever. The last one is we know Jesus is true God and eternal life. Everything that he has said and promised is true. So if that's the case, we can absolutely depend on him to be with us in all that we face in life. So we know these things. Now let's go and live those truths. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the truth of what's here in 1 John and uh, the reminder of all these things that you've been bringing out throughout the book. And Father, every one of us here is is an individual, is different. And I pray that uh, you will apply whatever... Um, you want to each one of our hearts whatever you have spoken to us about help us to hear it help us to understand it help us do it help us be obedient to you in whatever you have been speaking to us um, at this time so I thank you for who you are thank you that Jesus is the true God and eternal life and that we can know we have eternal life through him thank you for all you've done for us in Jesus name we pray amen